So bear with us for a moment as we prepare. Hopefully everybody is having a wonderful weekend today. And let's see, it looks like we've got just about everybody. We're still having a few people coming in, but we'll go ahead and get started in the interest of time. And I'd like to welcome everybody to In My Own Words, which is our Holocaust Survivor Story Series. This series is presented by a partnership between the Holocaust Memorial Resource and Education Center of Florida and the USC Shoah Foundation. My name is Lisa Bachman, and I am the Assistant Director at the Holocaust Center, and we are located just north of downtown Orlando. And we do hope that when we are able to open our doors, which hopefully is going to be pretty soon, that you'll be able to travel and come and visit us in person. Our mission is to use the history and lessons of the Holocaust to build a just and caring community free of anti-Semitism and all forms of prejudice and bigotry. Before I introduce our speakers today, I do want to thank all of the people who have generously made donations to support this free programming. Right now through September 15th, our friends at United Arts are running a campaign where they're matching all donations by adding on 15%. If you are able to make a gift to help us keep this programming going for free, please text the letters SFA to 91999 and we will have that in the chat for you. And thank you so much for your consideration. So let's get on with it. I am honored today to welcome back Paul Kuttner, who's going to introduce us to today's storyteller, Mr. Peter Gross. Mr. Gross is zooming in from his home in France, and he's going to share the fascinating story of how a very special group of people offered shelter to more than 3,500 Jewish people in private homes, hotels, on farms, and in schools. This is a story of a secret very well kept and protected, and I know it's going to inspire you. Paul Kuttner is a French teacher and Holocaust researcher. In 2012, he was a grant recipient of the French Embassy in the United States to incorporate history into his language classes. He was the researcher and writer of the 2017 exhibit, Conspiracy of Goodness, that was at the Harriet and Kenneth Kupperberg Holocaust Center on the campus of SUNY Queensboro Community College in New York City. He is zooming in uh, with us today from his home in Rockville, Maryland. And now it is my extreme pleasure an honor to turn this program over to Paul. Thank you very much, Lisa. Good afternoon. I'm Paul Kuttner and I teach French at the District of Columbia International School in Washington, DC. And I'm speaking to you live from my home in Rockville, Maryland. In America, presidential speeches generally end with the three words, God bless America. In France, which has strict separation of religion and politics, a president's speech usually ends with the seven words, vive la République et vive la France or long live the Republic and long live France. The only notable exception to that ending of which I am aware in my lifetime is on July 8th, 2004, when President Jacques Chirac traveled to the top of a mountain to a small village of 2,800 people, largely of homogenous demographics to address diversity in the face of, the, of a rise in anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-immigrant sen sentiment and racism. He talked about the history of this town and included the words, Telle est la France à laquelle je crois. This is the France I believe in. And he ended his speech with the words, je vous remercie, or I thank you. There are many ways to express gratitude in French, but this one is one of the most formal and the only one that actually includes the word vous or you. For those of us who speak French, this choice of words is not lost on us. The truth of the matter is that this was no ordinary village to visit. And even though this was a village where 95% of the population is white Christian, this is a very special village surrounded by about a dozen other special villages. Le Chambord sur Lignon, the main village of the Plateau Vivare Lignon, a bastion of Protestantism in a sea of Catholicism, is where approximately 3,500 Jews and as many as 5,000 total refugees found shelter from the Nazis and the Vichy French collaborators from 1940 to 1944. From the pictures I have seen, on July 8, 2004, several of the locals who went to hear present Shihak were elderly and had lived through these events. 
they and or their parents participated in this mission to save these refugees. As a French scholar, I can only surmise that President Chihak's choice of words, I thank you, was meant to be heard by these particular elders who came with their children and grandchildren. Many books have been written about Le Chambon, and I myself wrote a catalog of an exhibit about this village. But one of the very best and most recent comprehensive works about Le Chambon sur Lignon and the surrounding villages of the Plateau Vivar et Lignon is A Good Place to Hide by my friend Peter Groves. So picture this, I was sitting in the quiet car of an Amtrak train in January of 2015 when my phone rang and ordinarily I would have sent that call to voicemail. But then I saw who it was from, Nelly Trocmé Hewitt, the daughter of the late Pastor Trocmé of the Chambon. I dashed into the next car. She told me that an excellent book was coming out about Le Chambon in April of that year and asked for my help to get book signing events for Peter. And that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Our first event happened to be in a French restaurant in New York where the manager was the grandson of a couple who lived in Le Chambon. And so if you're wondering why Peter and I are sitting here with glasses of wine, it's to bring back the memory of the in-conversation event at the back of a restaurant looking like two Dean Martins sipping wine and discussing this book. These pages are extremely well written and constitute the most up-to-date English language work about this town's World War II history. It comes with high praise from Thomas Keneally, author of Schindler's List. At the end of today's event, a link will be put in the chat box about how you can get a copy of this book. It's the same link that was on the page for today's event and special thanks to Shakespeare and Company in New York City for handling book sales for today's event. So without further ado, let me welcome Peter Groves, a former journalist and publisher born in Australia, but who spent most of his career in the United Kingdom, who is joining us today from his home in the town of Saint-Pierre-d'Oléron, France. How are you, Peter? I'm just fine, and I raise my glass to you, Paul. I raise my glass to you, too, which brings hey, back this great is memories. Cross, by the way, this is the real thing. <laughs> um, so um, one of the things that, that I notice about your book is that um, you trace specific people, and that's a little different than some of the other works, both uh, film and books. Um, and you start with Oskar Rizovsky. Um, why did you decide to tr to trace his life, and what why why did you decide to um, actually write your book, book tracing the history of various people? Well, an Oscar was a, a a kind of natural, but I had I had weird motives for writing this book. I, and first of all, at the time that I started writing it, I believed I was a Huguenot. Uh, and this was a Huguenot village. This turned out to be complete claptrap, uh, uh, and I had to abandon that reason for writing it. Uh, but I had a couple of other things in mind. Uh, uh, one was that, uh, uh, that there's a, one of the myths that surrounds the behavior of, of the Jewish victims of the Holocaust was that they didn't fight back. And two of the central figures in my book were Pierre Fayol, who led the local resistance. By that, I don't mean he led a Jewish resistance. He led the local resistance chapter, uh, was Jewish. And there was also Oskar Rizovsky, uh, who uh, all he ever wanted to be was a doctor. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, the Vichy government had passed this particular law, which prevented Jews from studying medicine. And so poor old Oscar had to find another job. He couldn't go on to university, although he'd passed all the baccalaureate and stuff like that. And so he uh, got a job with the father of a friend uh, repairing typewriters. And also, uh, I mean, I hope there are people in this audience old enough to remember Ronio machines, those things that you uh, used to make copies of. Every school had one, uh, uh, when I was a lad anyway. Uh, and uh, so Oscar learned how to repair these machines. And he was given the local prefecture as his beat uh, and so he would go down twice a week with his, on a bicycle with his, with his bag full of brushes and, and typewriter fixing tools and repair all the typewriters. Now, it so happens, as, as uh, Paul could confirm, that the prefecture is the center of all papers uh, in France. I mean, that's where you get your driver's license, your permis de conduire. Uh, that's where you get your uh, 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 residence permits or every bit of paper uh, that matters. Uh, comes out of the, uh, 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 the prefecture. And so Oscar knew the machines that made this stuff literally inside out. Uh, and so the people who stopped Oscar being a doctor created probably the finest forger in World War II. 
uh, and he knocked out something like 5,000 sets of false papers in the space of a, a little under two years. But Oscar wasn't a man to do things by halves. And so rather than just knock you up a fake passport or a fake uh, uh, carte de dentite or something like that, Oscar would, would produce uh, what he called supporting documents. And so he would uh, produce library cards and Boy Scout memberships and trade union cards, uh, even parking fines, uh, so that if you were stopped, yes, that's that, that picture up on, uh, on the screen now is Oscar as a young lad. Uh, and I'll talk to you about that coat in a minute that he's wearing, uh, as it's quite important. But uh, uh, Oscar would, would give you not just one thing, like a, a cup d'identité or something like that. He would give you this wallet full of stuff. Uh, so that if you were pulled up by the gendarmes and someone said, your papers, monsieur, uh, then he could bring this blizzard of paper out of his wallet, all of which had the false name on it, uh, and was all pretty convincing. And there's no evidence that I was ever able to discover of anyone ever being busted uh, for carrying false papers. Oscar's stuff was so convincing uh, that everybody got away with it. And he actually had a team of forgers. Um, he had a, a guy called Sammy Charles worked with him. Uh, and they lived in a, a, a place just outside Le Chambon uh, called oh, La Fayol. And uh, it was really extraordinary. because I've been there. You can stay there. It's, a, it's what uh, the French call a chambre d'hôte and uh, what you would know as a and b uh, and it's uh, it's absolutely lovely place to stay. But where you stay now is a great deal more comfortable than where Oscar stayed, uh, because he had a, uh, a a couple of rooms in a barn, and he said the animals kept them warm at night in the winter, and they had running water. Well, what he meant by running water was there was a spring to an animal trough, and he could walk out from his little room in the in the uh, uh, La Fayol, uh, farmhouse and splash his face and get some drinking water from the from the uh, the spring that flowed into there. So uh, he, uh, he was really quite a character. I, I didn't know him all that well, uh, but I got to know him. Could you put that uh, picture up again, Paul? Of the, uh, the one of him uh, as a younger man? Uh, yeah, the one of the younger guy, uh, guy with, the, yes. with the leather jacket on. Yes. Yeah, right. Now that leather jacket has quite a story. Uh, uh, Oscar had been to uh, somewhere in uh, Clement Ferrand, I think. Uh, he'd gone to a, an event and the police raided it and there was a lot of shooting and general sort of mayhem. Uh, and so he got out uh, and he was in the street and he was stopped in the street uh, and by three gendarmes who proceeded to search him. Now what they were looking for uh, uh, was ammunition. Uh, and so they started from, the, from his ankles patting his pockets. Uh, uh, and when they got as far as the pocket that you can see his, his left hands in now, uh, uh, then they could hear this wonderful telltale rattle. And I thought, gotcha, mate. Uh, uh, you know, we've got, got, got some ammunition here. And the policeman put his hand into the pocket and pulled out a packet of cough lollies, uh, cough sweets. Uh, and so uh, his mates all laughed at him. So he just kicked Oscar away. Now, if he kept going, that coat was made specially for Oscar by a butcher in Lyon who was, who, for whom Oscar had made some papers. And the sleeves were completely false. Uh, and so if he'd kept going, uh, the policeman, that he would have found those sleeves stuffed with fake papers and all the equipment and, uh, that you needed for uh, producing fake documents. But he never got that far because he got the cough sweets instead. Uh, but uh, Oscar, he was really was quite a character. And you might like to know, like I said earlier, that he, he wanted to become a doctor. After the war, he did become a doctor, and he went on to be president of the General Medical Council of France. That's amazing. Um, one of the things that you mentioned before were, were the various different papers, and it's interesting because I was going through some papers that the Museum of the Chambon actually let me use when I was uh, making up the exhibit in New York. And I was going through some of those papers recently because I gave a presentation in Baltimore, and I found that he had so many different papers, like you said, the plausibility papers, he had an agricultural, pa like he, he had registered at, an ag at the agricultural um, committee, um, he had library fines, I mean, he had so many different things in his name, he had a student card, he had obviously an identity card, but it was just to add to the story that he had 
these different things. So it wasn't just that he had one fake paper. He just had paper after paper after paper. Um, one of the things that's very interesting that I think is worth noting um, is where he kept his tools. Um, for, <laughs> yes. I'll let yes. you describe that. Okay. Okay, well, uh, uh, he stayed uh, in this farmhouse, which, as I say, is now a and b uh, uh, It was run by a guy called Henri Eritier. Uh, and Eritier was, uh, knew what Oscar was up to, although uh, the, uh, nobody talked. Right? It was uh, absolutely not possible or not permitted to discuss anything with anybody. But Eritier was, knew what Oscar was up to. Uh, and he, uh, there were a lot of raids going on. And if the gendarmes or the Germans raided a house and found stuff, then they were perfectly capable of burning it down. Uh, so Eritier didn't want any of this to happen. And so he went to Oscar and said, look, I think instead of keeping all your forgery kit uh, in the barn, I think we'd better find a better place to hide it. And so Oscar went along with this. And Eritier had a really good idea. He had all these beehives because he, he uh, produced his own honey. And two of the beehives were empty. So he said, well, stick, stick all this stuff in the beehive. Well, it would have taken a Gestapo man of extraordinary courage to stick his bare hand into a beehive to see if there were any, any forgery kits in there. So uh, as a result of this, Oscar's uh, secret remained a secret till the end of the war. Yes, indeed. Um, and, uh, and it's amazing that he never got caught and, and that none of the other people who were, you know, making, I think it was about 50 fake papers a week, that it was amazing that they never got caught. Um, and, um, but I wanna actually change the conversation a little bit to one of the main actors of the village, and that's Pastor Trokme. And Pastor Trokme um, is uh, uh, obviously one of the great heroes of this story. Uh, and he, he was an improbable person to be in, you know, the pastor of a very cold, uh, kind of sleepy village. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about him and how he ended up there? Right. Well, uh, uh, as you rightly say, he was an interesting man. At one point, he was tutor to the Rockefeller children. Uh, in New York. He did a spell in New York and he earned a bit of money on the side by looking after the Rockefellers. Uh, but uh, I, that, I mentioned that in passing. Uh, he came from a rich family. Uh, uh, his uh, 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 father uh, was a, uh, owned a, a mill that created cloth up in northern France, up near Amiens. Uh, and uh, uh, they were in the village. I, I always have difficulty pronouncing it. If you live in San Francisco, you think it's called San Quentin, but it's not. It's called Saint, Saint Quentin. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so they, here they were, this rich family. And Andre, uh, 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 Saint Quentin, I'm going to give it the English pronunciation, uh, straddles the River Somme, uh, where some of the bitterest fighting in World War I took place. And young Trocmay, age 10, could witness people, bodies being brought in barrows uh, through the streets of, of uh, uh, St. Quentin. Uh, and it made him a lifelong pacifist. He never, he never stopped being a pacifist throughout. Uh, and his one great worry in Le Chambon uh, was that the, the passive resistance, which he heavily believed in and talked for and, and, and uh, sermonized from the pulpit, uh, would somehow break down an armed conflict would break out between the village and the uh, either the Vichy or the Germans. Uh, uh, this never really happened, or not in any strong way. Uh, but nevertheless, that was his worry. So here we had this rich kid, uh, but a bit of a maverick. Uh, and uh, the father was uh, very religious and was very keen for him to uh, 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 take the cloth, as it were. Uh, and so he went to uh, Paris and studied uh, to become a Protestant pastor. Uh, and he then, had, because he was a maverick, uh, because he was a troublemaker, uh, he had great difficulty getting a parish. Uh, and he'd be accepted uh, by a parish. He'd go along and do an interview and they'd think, oh, yeah, this is the bloke for us. Uh, and then the, uh, the central uh, Protestant council would say, oh, you can't have him. Uh, and so that was the end of poor old Andre. Uh, and that happened to him three times before he finally got this uh, job in, in uh, uh, Le Chambon. And in that case, the church council 
uh, uh, said it was a temporary appointment and therefore they didn't need the approval of the Central Council. And so that's how Andre came to be the pastor. But he never gave up uh, those, uh, those pacifist views. And you have to remember that pacifists at this point were regarded as something not unlike traitors. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a much more honorable uh, calling now to be a pacifist than it was at the time. And so he, he went there and uh, what in practice happened uh, was that he, he decided that uh, there were all these internment camps uh, where uh, French Jews in particular, but also people that the, the, uh, the authorities didn't like the look of, were all interned. And he wanted to uh, work in the camps. And he wanted to bring blankets and food and medicine and all sorts of stuff like that to the camps. And he went down to, uh, uh, to Marseille, in fact, and, and talked to a lot of Quakers down there, including American Quakers. And uh, they said to him, look, we've got plenty of blankets and food and everything else. What we really need is somewhere safe to send people. We can sometimes spring children from these camps. Very hard to spring adults, but we can spring children. Uh, uh, and they said, but when we've sprung them, we don't know where to send them. So if you're telling me that you can take them in, in this place you call Le Chambon, uh, then that's the biggest service you can offer the world. Uh, and so it was Andre Trocmé's trip to Marseille and his meeting with the Quakers that created the sheltered village. Uh, uh, that, was, that was where they sent people that they'd managed to get out of the camps. And also the word was out that the people would look after you in Le Chambon. And so uh, voluntary refugees would turn up there uh, uh, having heard down the, the grapevine uh, that people would look after them. And there were also these children who were legally removed from these internment camps, uh, separated from their parents. I wonder what that might sound familiar to you. Uh, uh, but that's what happened. They were separated from their parents and sent off to Le Chambon. Uh, and, and there they uh, were in hostels and all sorts of uh, uh, sheltered accommodation in, in Le Chambon. So uh, Trocme, uh well, there, there was never a committee that was the organizing committee that knew how to handle all this. There was nobody in charge. There was nobody gave directions. There were no written rules. It was all done on an ad hoc basis. But nevertheless, if it had not been for Andre Trocmé, then I don't think the rescue operation which took place in Chambon would have taken place at all. And it would certainly not have been in the form that it subsequently uh, transformed itself into. Uh, so one of the survivors I worked with, unfortunately, he passed away about four years ago, Rudy Appel. I did a few, he actually was at an event that you and I did together, and um, he was actually at a different event that I did, and he said, if I get the words right, these were, the people of Le Chambon were very simple people. They did not read the daily newspapers, but they read their Bible daily. And uh, I want to sort of swing that back to Pastor Tokme for a second. Um, because I want to sort of talk about the influence that the pastor of this little village had uh, over the, the, the villagers. Uh, and maybe you can talk a little bit about his famous sermon of June 23rd, 1940. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, I mean, it's hard for us to really visualize this now, uh, but, but perhaps it's more true in the United States than it is in most other countries. Uh, but to be the pastor uh, in, a, in a village which was predominantly Protestant, it was 90 something percent Protestant, uh, and he was the Protestant pastor. But to be that person made you a civic leader. You carried as much weight in the village, possibly as the mayor. Uh, and so it was widely said and written uh, that if a, a problem came up, if there was a decision to be taken, uh, then people would say, we must go and talk to Trockman. Uh, Trocmé must be informed about this. What does Trocmé think? Uh, and so Trocmé was uh, a, a natural leader uh, and he naturally led the people of Le Chambon. Uh, uh, now, Paul, you were, you're asking, uh, you know, how did he go about this? And, and, and there used to be a meeting once a month of the pastors because it, we have to remember there's, there's huge rows go on to this day uh, uh, on the plateau 
over who did what during World War II. Uh, I'm pretty clear in my own mind about who did what during World War II, uh, but there's a suggestion that somehow Le Chambon uh, uh, is taking all the credit for all this, and it was really other villages around that, uh, that were at least as important. Well, I mean, that's hogwash, frankly. Uh, 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 Le Chambon was the key to the whole thing. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think I, I could even prove that. Uh, the uh, uh, Yad Vashem in, in, uh, uh, in Israel uh, awards uh, 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 just among the nations for people who, I mean, the qualification for this award was that you had to have uh, rescued more than one Jew at a risk to your own life. Uh, and there were some 70 or so uh, people who were nominated as just among the nations on the plateau of uh, Vivre Lignon. Uh, and uh, of those 70 or so, more than 50 came from the village of Le Chambon, and the others came in smaller numbers from the surrounding villages. So on the one hand, yes, it's true uh, that the other villages played a part, but I would have to tell you that the biggest role was Le Chambon. And that also probably has to do with the fact that the Chambon and in some part, in some respect, saint Agave, which is the, one of the neighboring villages, are the two biggest villages on the plateau. So, you know, the, one of some of the villages only have 400 people in them. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so and, and Le Chambon is geographically in the center of the plateau. Yeah. Um, but um, I wanted to actually talk about um, so Pastor Tokme gave this sermon on, Ju on June 23, 1940. Now France fell to the Germans the day before. And France, and, and, and um, so there was the northern and western part of France that were under direct German control. And then there was this other two-fifths of the country, called, sometimes called the southern zone, sometimes called the free zone, though not exactly free, that was led by Marshal Pétain, who was a World War I hero. And um, uh, the armistice was signed in the very train car that I believe Hitler, or, or excuse me, that it was not signed with Hitler in the very train car that um, the World War I armistice was signed. And it was supposed to be a big humiliation to France. And so um, uh, Le Chambon, which is only a couple of, couple of hundred kilometers south of Vichy, the capital of uh, the southern zone, um, uh, we, we, they found themselves on the next day and there was this sermon basically saying that we're going to reject what this armistice is having us do. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. And you say the timing was extraordinary that, uh, uh, and people in France, uh, they will tell you this to this day, they didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, here they've signed this surrender in the most humiliating terms and the same railway carriages you've just said, Paul, uh, that the Treaty of Versailles was signed in. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, so this was like, you know, we're, 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 uh, things are not going to be uh, pretty uh, from now on in. And Trotme stood up in, in the church with his, his uh, uh, sub, uh, assistant pastor, uh, Edward Tice, uh, just uh, beside him. And he read out what he described as a joint statement. It was a kind of manifesto. Uh, and in this, he said, uh, that we've got to resist, 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 resist. Uh, but we, we don't want to fight them with guns. Uh, we, can, we can use, and he used this extraordinary phrase that still reverberates today. He said, we'll fight them with the weapons of the spirit. Uh, and, and the weapons of the spirit consisted of, of civil disobedience, of sheltering people who, who were uh, being persecuted, uh, of, of generally behaving in it. Uh, I, I can't get, um, um, people have uh, asked me over and over again, and I can never get beyond the word decent. People behaved decently in the Chambon and in the surrounding villages. Uh, and human decency was in pretty short supply uh, uh, during most of World War II. Uh, but these people exhibited it and then some. And that was really quite remarkable. But Trockmay's sermon, his Weapons of the Spirit sermon, uh, it was really a, a kind of turning point because uh, I, I had uh, a friend, Catherine Compasetis, uh, who was in the church at the time and who heard this sermon. 
and she said you could have heard a pin drop. Uh, I just I just opened your book to that page. <laughs> if you want me to read that, if you want me to read that quote out, yeah, um, absolutely, yes. In the church, you could have heard a pin drop. I was only fifteen, yet I clearly remember my mood going from lost and frightened to safe and calm. Yes, absolutely. And then she goes on to, and then and 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 then she actually really goes on to say how much the the religious aspect of what um, uh, Tokme was saying what really inspired her. Can you imagine what a sermon like that meant to us at a time of fear and despair to be told in church that if the military situation had changed, our source of inspiration had not? It was to follow in the steps of Jesus in the New Testament. We were not lost. We still had direction. The day remains one of the most illuminating of my life, similar in feel to when I heard de Gaulle speak his message that we'd lost a battle, not the war. When everything seemed lost, there was one man who refused to give up. And it's really, it really speaks to both the inspiration of of Trocme over the village and sort of this civil this civil leader he was as the pastor, and how much that was based in their religion. Yeah, I think should we talk a little bit, Paul, about Catherine? Uh, because yes, in fact, I have a I have a, a um, picture of her. Oh, right. That I think you shared with me once, but oh, there yeah. it is. Yeah, that's her. That's her. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Catherine, uh, 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 I think I, you, this is not very gallant for me to say it, and she's now a, a very, very attractive, uh, about an 80-year-old, but maybe a bit older. Uh, but she said she wasn't much to look at at the time, and I think that we could look at her picture now and perhaps agree with it. Uh, but she, uh, she came from a rich family. Her father it was a very successful doctor in Paris. Uh, and they spent their summers every year on, in Le Chambon, just outside Le Chambon. And um, uh, when the war broke out, they were still there. Uh, and so they took the decision uh, that the, the husband, the doctor, would go back to Paris, but mum and the girls would stay on in Le Chambon. And they just thought they'd be safer there. Now, if they had known at the time that 18 months later, Catherine, the one you can, whose picture you can see now, was running suitcases of money for the resistance. Uh, then they might have wondered whether it was all that safe in Le Chambon after all. It's, and she, and, and, um, she was one of the best friends of Nelly Trocme Hewitt, who I mentioned in my opening statement. And tell us about this, how secret these operations were, Peter. Well, that's right. I mean, these, these two were very close friends at school. As, as, and we all know what close friendships are like at school. And they totally trusted each other. And they thought they had no secrets from each other. And Nellie found out that Catherine was running money for the resistance when she read the first draft of my book. She'd never and heard it before. And so that was 75 years later. That, That's right. Uh, yes. Right. That's right. right. Um, and and, and it, interestingly enough, both Catherine Campesedes and Nelly Trocme live in the United States now. Um, uh, Catherine lives in California, is that right? That's and, right. She lives south um, of San Francisco, yes. And, and Nelly lives in uh, Minnesota. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about, actually, the resistance and sort of the... Uh, the, um, the, the sort of sparring there was between the pacifists and the resistance. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and basically, uh, uh, I mean, throughout France, the armed resistance, I, I mean, the, the French uh, gloss this over, but, but it's nevertheless the truth, uh, that the armed resistance didn't really get going till about 1943. I mean, a few people fired a few shots before that, uh, but there was no kind of organized sabotage and people didn't blow up bridges or anything like that. They just kind of made a nuisance to themselves. And, and I, the, uh, this is not to dispute their heroism, but it wasn't very effective. Uh, but from 1943 onwards, the resistance got really organized. Uh, and the resistance on the plateau was both armed and organized by an extraordinary American called Virginia Hall, uh, and Virginia Hall uh, uh, had been a diplomat uh, and had uh, lost her, I think it was her right leg in a shooting accident in Turkey. And so she had a wooden leg, which she called Cuthbert. Uh, and she insisted on joining the SOE, uh, which was the special operations executive that s sent agents into France. 
And she had been working as a journalist in Lyon and she uh, uh, reconnoitred this whole area and she uh, introduced herself to people. So she had plenty of contacts in the area and she was the one who organised uh, drops of uh, machine guns, drops of grenades, drops of explosives and so on. And when the resistance got going, as it did, in, particularly in 1944, uh, then they got quite good at blowing up trains and, and, uh, and generally making a serious nuisance of themselves as far as the Germans were concerned. Virginia Hall was also a very, very interesting um, character. I'm currently reading her biography, um, the, there's a French version of it by Ber, uh, Bernard Muzi, and there's an American version of it that is called A Woman of No Importance that came out, I think, last year or the year before. And one of the things that I found fascinating about her is that before she was in the Chambon, she, what, one of her um, contacts was a madam of a brothel. And she, the uh, madam's employees, shall we say, um, serviced German soldiers and were getting it was and they were getting information from the german soldiers which would then be given to virginia hall and um the madam whose name is germaine i can't remember her last name um the the that the brothel had so many hidden rooms she was also hiding jewish families in this in this room and so virginia hall was a very resourceful um person with her contacts um, and, um, and then she, she ended up, it's pretty extraordinary to me that she ended up on the top of this mountain. And I think it's worth talking about for a minute, the fact that this mountain is, you know, 3000 feet above sea level. It is, even in July, you can be caught in pretty vicious hailstorms. Um, I don't know, I think, uh, P Peter, the first time you went there, I, certainly the first time I went there, I was... I, it was so scary, some of the roads to get there, that um, at one point I just had to pull over because I had a line of about 20 cars frustrated with me going, you know, 20 kilometers an hour uh, up this mountain. Um, it was pretty extraordinary, sort of the, um, sort of the geographic location, and, and maybe you can talk about how this worked both for the pacifists who were hiding Jewish refugees and the resistance. Yeah, uh, that's absolutely true. Uh, that uh, I mean, you couldn't call it inaccessible. I mean, there's a perfectly good road goes there. Uh, but it's like that, uh, if you can imagine, uh, think yourself back to when you were 10 years old and your parents were driving somewhere and you kept uh, chirping from the back seat, are we there yet? When will we get there? <laughs> well, it feels like that when you go to the Chambord, when you're driving to the Chambord. First of all, I, I endlessly get lost. There's a place called Issinger, which is absolutely fatal for me. Uh, I, I, I don't it's think a one-way street. Yes. In a straight line. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, it's very remote. And so this was uh, uh, pretty helpful. And it's been bypassed by invading armies. Uh, and the, the Romans obviously occupied it because there are villages in there with Roman names. Uh, but but uh, when the, uh, well, the Saracens, I think it was, uh, in, in the ninth century, invaded France and as they they went up France and when they came to the plateau they kind of separated and went round it and rejoined north and kept going about another 150 kilometers further north so it's been left alone just simply because it's valueless I mean there's no oil there there's no coal there's no steel there's nothing there except there's a lot of snow <laughs> uh, a lot of cows it's okay right. for cows, uh, but there's not much by way of natural resources uh, so it's not worth conquering uh, and it's a really serious nuisance to conquer it uh, because it's a huge area with not many people in it. Uh, so you're going to have to send about a division of soldiers there, 10,000 men, uh, uh, to hold on to uh, about 10,000 civilians who've got nothing to offer you except cows. Uh, so there's not much uh, point in, in kind of seriously invading it and locking it down. Uh, so that's, that's the first thing to say. Uh, but from the resistance point of view, for a very long time, uh, they were delighted that, that uh, uh, pacifism prevailed because uh, it meant that the Germans weren't terribly interested in them. As far as they were concerned, that as far as the Germans were concerned, uh, uh, who, what, who's up on the top of this mountain? Oh, there's a whole lot of pacifists up there. They won't cause us any trouble. Uh, uh, and so Fayol and his men uh, were able to train and arm, uh, armed by uh, uh, 
drops from uh, from Britain, but, uh, organized by Virginia Hall. Uh, and then, as I say, they were they were in a position to cause serious trouble uh, for the Germans in 1944 in particular. So, so the very remoteness, the geography of the the, uh, the village of Le Chambon was a major player in this whole story. So there are, speaking of, there are two things that I want, because I'm looking at the time and we're going to open to questions, but there are two, two very quick things that I wanted to talk about. Um, and one is that, um, is about Tokme's arrest. Um, so the, there, the authorities did come to arrest Tokme and Tais and yeah. um, the, the uh, and Dachsisak, the head of the school. Um, and that was not any ordinary arrest. And the sort of the ceremony of his arrest, uh, if you will, um, really spoke to the culture of the village. Uh, maybe you could tell that story. Well, indeed, uh, yeah, I mean, three of them were arrested. Uh, I, I, I should give you, because the measure of the man, uh, that uh, the, I think was the, this was the uh, Vichy police uh, came to Trotman at one point and said, right, we want on our desk on Sunday morning, we want the names of every Jew in this area. Uh, uh, you know where they all are. Uh, and Trotmay responded with this highly memorable phrase. I think uh, uh, Pat Henry used it as a title of a book. Uh, uh, Trotmay said, uh, we don't know Jews, we only know men. Uh, and <laughs> he failed to produce his list. Uh, which was, uh, I, I suppose, part of the charge sheet that they finally arrested him. Uh, but yes, they did come to the village and they did arrest him and his uh, offsider, Edward Tice, and Roger Darsisak, who was the headmaster of the primary school. And they were all uh, carted off to a camp and banged up for about a month, I think it was. Uh, and then it, the story has a, has a sort of ghastly ending uh, in that uh, a lot of people interceded on their behalf. Uh, and uh, uh, including, we think, uh, the Prime Minister of France. And uh, uh, so they were ultimately released. And so they then had to sign a bit of paper uh, saying they'd be loyal servants of, of uh, uh, Marshal Pétain. And they all refused. They said, oh, no, we'd rather stay here. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, and so they all marched back to their quarters. Uh, uh, and uh, refused the, uh, uh, the the release that they were offered. So in the end, uh, the the authorities had got orders to release them, and they uh, thought, well, the only way we can really do what we're told is to release them, whether they sign this bit of paper or not. So they were released without signing the bit of paper. Three days later, the entire camp uh, of 500 people were packed on trains, and not a single one of them was ever heard from again. Which is pretty amazing um, that they were somehow able to get out of there without signing that document, which said something like, you know, Marshal Pétain is the, you know, you know, I, I play, you know, pledge allegiance to Marshal Pétain. And they said, no, we're, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're Christian pastors. And we're the only person we can, you know, pledge allegiance to is God or Jesus. And, um, and, and so that's um, sort of, where that um, that uh, difference in um, opinion was. Um, there was also an episode, uh, we, you mentioned earlier about all the children that were brought out and that they could be brought to Le Chambon. Um, there was an incident um, with uh, Auguste Bonny, who was working for the Swiss Red Cross. Um, and he ran, I think, three or four different houses in Le Chambon. And there was an incident where the French authorities came to arrest the children. And he had a few words. And maybe you can let us know what those were. Well, <laughs> I think I wrote in the book that there's a mug born every minute. And Bernie's uh, great good fortune was that he was surrounded by nine of them. Uh, and so they all turned up half past six in the morning with a list of people they wanted to arrest. Uh, so Bernie said, well, you know, you, you can't do that now. Uh, uh, and this is the uh, uh, Swiss uh, territory that you're just currently standing on. And we have diplomatic immunity. So would you kindly go away uh, uh, and, and don't come back unless you bring someone much more senior than any of you. Uh, and so they were mug enough to actually take him at his word, and they left uh, and uh, uh, came back. 
they'd arrived at half past six in the morning. They came back at half past nine in the morning, by which time Bernie had, had breakfasted all the kids in the thing and told them to get the hell out and into the forest and, and don't come back until they were all collected. Uh, and so uh, uh, the, the, <laughs> the gendarmes returned at 9.30 and they had to, I'm afraid, go away empty-handed yet again. Uh, uh, none of the people on the list was forthcoming. Indeed. Um, so I'm looking at the time and I'm going to turn the, the program over to Serena, who's going to um, moderate the questions that are in the chat box. Hello, everyone. My name is Serena Ahmed and I am program coordinator with the Holocaust Center. It is really quite special to gather virtually with you all, friends from across the globe even, and to listen and learn in such a special discussion between Peter Groves and Paul Kuttner. And um, as Paul has, ex has explained, I'll be posing just a few questions that you have all written here in the chat. We have quite a variety, so I'm excited to engage now with our incredibly distinguished guests. And I'm just going to hop right in. Uh, this question is from David Bottomley, and it's a rather specific question. I'm really curious your response is, did the armed resistance take off, and he says, pardon the pun, when the 8th Air Force began their bombing campaigns? I defer uh, to Peter on that. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think. Uh, and the bombing campaigns, were, and the the British and the, uh, for that matter, the Americans were sending uh, great sort of fleets of bombers over uh, from about 1942 onwards. Uh, so, uh, as I said earlier, the resistance didn't really get going till 1943. So, I don't think these were connected. I think that what happened was this: uh, uh, first of all, the the uh, uh, at the end of 1942, I think that's right, no, uh, November 42. Uh, uh, the Allies invaded uh, Algeria, uh, which had been a French colony, uh, and the Vichy French didn't put up much of a fight, actually. Uh, uh, and so the Germans formed the view that the Vichy uh, uh, were useless when it came to uh, opposing Allied invasions. And so they, uh, as Paul told you earlier, uh, they had already occupied three-fifths of France, leaving two-fifths of it unoccupied, and they now occupied the last bit. And this created sort of terrible confusion and, and anger. Uh, and so the support for the resistance was much stronger now that the whole of France was occupied by the Germans. That's fact number one. Fact number two uh, is that uh, the Russians were at this point beginning to turn things around on the Eastern Front. Uh, and the, uh, the German army was being chewed up something rotten by the, by the Russians. Uh, and uh, it, it looked as though uh, I, I think the right English expression would be to say this one could go either way. Uh, in other words, it wasn't certain. I mean, Hitler looked like he couldn't lose up to this point, and now it looked like he might lose. Uh, and so the gendarmes in particular uh, 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 thought, well, we can't be too harsh on the, uh, the local population, or the least they'll do is tar and feather us when this is all over, if they win. Uh, and so they proceeded to uh, did not uh, exactly persecute the uh, uh, the resistance as, as viciously and as voraciously as they might have. Uh, so the reality is that from 1942 onwards, the the resistance wasn't resisted much uh, uh, by the the local French, uh, and the Germans thought they had uh, they were totally preoccupied with what was going on on the Eastern Front with Russia. Uh, and so I think that was the real signal for the resistance to get going. The fact that they weren't meeting much resistance at all, and the fact that the Germans were preoccupied with the Eastern Front. Uh, and so I don't think that the bombing, uh, I mean, it, it may have cheered people up, it might have uh, uh, made them feel that they weren't alone. And, and it would also have, have fed into the notion that Hitler might actually lose the war uh, uh, if the Allies were bombing with impunity as far uh, across as Berlin, uh, and they were bombing into, into France, into factories and so on in France, and they were certainly bombing into places like Dresden and so on in Germany, then that would have sent a signal to reinforce the idea that Hitler might not win the war. 
Thank you so much. Um, and so that we continue to hear from Peter and Paul as much as possible, I'm, doing, I'm going to just continue with offering questions from our wonderful attendees. Um, this next question is really a combination of two. And so please stay with me as we'll take just a moment to read in full. From Jackie Panton, why do you think there was so much resistance and support in the Chambon when people like Martin Niemöller and Dietrich Bonhoeffer had struggles with the confessing church in Germany, primarily fear. And I think this really ties into another question that we had a few folks engaging with in the chat, which was that knowing the consequences for keeping this secret, why, what do you think drove people to be so committed to keeping the secret? And Aleda Baum made a comment um, that a spirit, it was a spiritual commitment in part as well as peer pressure because who would want to be the villager who gave it away? Um, and so I, we really wanna hear from Peter and Paul, what do you think drove people to be so committed to keeping the secret and why particularly here in Chimbal? Should I start, Paul? You can go ahead, yeah. Okay. Uh, the first thing to say is that this was a village that was predominantly Huguenot, not merely Protestant, but Huguenot. And that's important uh, because the Huguenots have been well persecuted for 250 years. Uh, they, they, it goes back to Louis XIV and, uh, uh, and the uh, overturning of the Edict of Nantes and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, so they had 250 years of experience of being kicked around uh, and they could see other people being kicked around and, and they knew what it felt like. Uh, so they were, they had an instant sympathy uh, with the Jews uh, uh, who were uh, obviously being persecuted through no fault of their own. Uh, there was also, a, and this is not that important, but it's just worth mentioning, uh, that there's a, there was a strain of the Protestant um, uh, religion on the plateau. I can't remember their names now. Uh, uh, the, Darby, but, the Darbyists? Yeah, that, that's it. Yeah. And they believed that, that the Jews were the chosen people and they were jolly lucky to have them resting in their barn. Uh, and, and so uh, they willingly gave shelter uh, to what they regarded as the chosen people. Uh, so so th those two factors combined. And bear in mind that when, when they sent people out into the forest to hide, some of the hiding places dated back 250 years and that were set up by the Huguenots uh, to avoid the sort of royalist uh, persecution. Uh, I would agree with everything that Peter said. And the other thing that I would m maybe also suggest is that um, in France, Protestantism is a very, very small uh, um, part of the population. So we're talking about um, maybe 2% of the total population of uh, Fr of all of France is Protestant. And so, but 95% of these villages are Protestant. And so uh, where there might have been difficulty in other countries, notably Germany, um, where there is um, most of Germany is Protestant, except for parts of Bavaria, um, there was more of a central um, sort of a centralized system of Protestantism in France. It was actually one of the reasons why uh, Trocmé had such a hard time getting his position. Uh, but it also meant a more, because there were such a small group of people, there was so much more strength in numbers. And you see in other parts of France that had big Protestant populations, there were other actions. In fact, joining us on this call today is the former mayor of the village of Diolophie, Christine Priotto, and half of Diolophie is Protestant, and that was a, that, that was a major um, piece of the puzzle as to why certain places were more uh, friendly or united than others. Um, the, it also meant that organiz Protestant organizations worked together, Protestant organizations like the Quakers, La Cimad, which is um, like a um, a, uh, a refugee agency uh, that was Protestant. And um, uh, keep in mind that these were Calvinists, and so Switzerland also played a big role in this story. Uh, so uh, I think that where there might have been uh, sort of fractious um, groups in other countries, in France it sort of worked to the, um, to the, to the benefit of, uh, of the outcome 
that this was a very small part of the population. Paul, uh, is there any chance you can put up on the screen that picture of the main street of Le Chambon? Oh, yes, yes. Um, I, have, uh, if, I if, have it right here. If I voice, uh, then I'll explain about this picture coming up. Uh, the, the, uh, the French have a sort of uh, a generalized view of Protestants that they're honest, hardworking, truthful, and ever so slightly dull. Uh, and if you look at this picture, which is literally of the main street going up the railway station in the middle of the Chambon, uh, you'll see that if you look at those windows over on the left, you'll see there are no window boxes full of geraniums. You can't see them too much on the right. Uh, but the, there's no color in this. It's a gray town, the Chambon. Uh, I, I mean, it's quite an important tourist town, and I wouldn't want to talk any of you out of not going there. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, don't expect nightclubs and discos, you won't get them. And if you look at that picture, you'll see that the only real splash of color uh, is the no parking sign over on the right. And the other thing that I'll share while, um, while I have it up is the picture of the Protestant church, which is also worth noting, um, which is, so this inscription on top says, aimez-vous les uns les autres, which means love one another. Um, and so it's literally written in stone when you walk into the church. Um, but um, Protestants, uh, or I, I should say this particular group of Protestants, um, unlike their Catholic counterparts in France, which have these majestic uh, cathedrals with all sorts of ornate decorations and stained glass windows, Pro th this group of Protestants do not really decorate. Um, and like, like Rudy said, uh, that, that survivor I quoted before, these were very simple people. Um, and this is a town of mostly farmers. Um, and the most important person in the village was the pastor and the school teacher. Thank you both so much. It's really such an honor. And I, I, I know we don't have um, much more time, but um, if we can just ask one more question from our audience before we conclude today. Um, this next question is from Shira Schmidt in Israel who asks, were children who were orphaned by the end of the war readily returned to relatives or Jewish organizations? Can you all shed some light on that? Well, I, I start? Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it, it was one of the biggest problems at the end of World War II uh, to try to re uh, reunite families. I mean, there were concentration camp survivors uh, who'd been separated from their children. But to find out which child belonged to which survivor uh, was a huge, 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 huge job. And it was never fully carried out. Uh, uh, it was never successfully carried out totally. Uh, people did their best, uh, but it didn't always work. Uh, so that's the first thing to say. Uh, the second thing to say is that uh, this is a real oddity, but a lot of the children who were in Le Chambon protected were there legally. Uh, they'd been sprung by the, uh, uh, the Quakers from the internment camps, separated from their parents, who'd all gone off to, uh, we, we now fear we know what fate in, in a trains in Germany, but the children were legally in Le Chambon. They were, uh, I can't, there's a, a the phrase. The term is transferred, I think. Something the term that, is something transferred, like, yeah. yeah. Anyway, Paul, I, 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 I've had my say, you go. Um, so uh, a lot of what happened to the specific survivors was, was mainly sort of uh, surviving children were mainly, it was mainly a case by case basis. So um, a lot of the children didn't know what happened to their parents if their parents were alive. Most, in most cases, they weren't. But it, that, that question from what I have read and what I have seen and what I've heard talking to people, that question was not resolved in Le Chambon. So um, I can think of, um, so Rudy, who I talked about before, he's one of the only survivors I met who stayed in Le Chambon the whole time. Um, he knew where his mother was. Um, and she was in Grenoble and she was safe in Grenoble. Um, but Hannah and Max Liebman, who you'll hear from in two weeks, um, they did escape to Switzerland um, and they really only found out at the end of, they had ideas that their parents were not alive anymore and they, had, they could speculate, but they really had no idea what happened. And so a lot of the time, whether they, the, these children stayed in Le Chambon the whole time or whether they um, were in Le Chambon for a while before, on their way to Switzerland, which is a whole other part of the story, 
um, which Peter tells very well in his book. Um, uh, that question of what happened to the children after the war, were they united with rel reunited with relatives or not, that really was sort of resolved outside of Le Chambon. There were, of all the people who were saved in Le Chambon, I believe only one ever chose to stay. Um, so we're talking about, you know, of the approximate 3,500 Jews and about 5,000 total refugees, the other refugees were Spanish Republicans, um, which was a large part of the, the refugees, um, other people just fleeing the, um, the deprivations of the city um, because there was nothing to eat in the cities. So a lot of children were being sent to Le Chambon even if they weren't Jewish or a Spanish Republican. But um, uh, so of all of that, those people, only one ever stayed in the Chambon. So really that, that, that answer is, can't be answered in the Chambon. It's answered mm. out of the Chambon. Thank you so much. Um, Peter and Paul, it's been an absolute privilege to have this time together with you. Um, and, and thank you to, uh, so much to our audience always for being with us and, and for writing such meaningful questions and dialogues into the chat. In conclusion of our event today, I have just a few important reminders or new announcements for those joining us for the first time. Uh, first, please know that the recording of this event will be uploaded to our website shortly. Um, and there are links being posted by my colleagues in the chat. So, so you can share this program with any of your family, friends, colleagues who miss this discussion and they can watch it at their leisure. Um, and after today, you will also receive an email with a link to take a short survey where you can provide your feedback. And if you may, please just take a few moments. We greatly appreciate your insight into how we can improve our time together in all future events. And, um, and can, I oh, just yes, make, can I just make one pitch? Because uh, so in two weeks from today on September 13th, on Sunday, September 13th at 3 p.m. Eastern, we're gonna have two of the survivors who are featured in Peter's book Hannah and Max Liebmans, two of my real, two of my real life heroes. Um, and so they will be sharing their story with us two weeks from today. Thank you, Paul. Um, yes, so as Paul explained, I, I wanna actually just explain that a little bit more. The same time, Sunday, September 13th, please join us uh, for this special session with Paul Kuttner as part of our In My Own Words series, where we will hear from Holocaust survivors, Hannah and Max Liebman, who will be honoring us with their story of their past, full of survival and love. Hannah and Max married actually on April 4th, 14th, 1945, and um, just recently celebrated their 75th wedding anniversary. So we hope to see you again soon at, at that event. And also this Wednesday, September 2nd, is our next Strategies for Action event where the Holocaust Center's education director, Rachel Lucy Hitt, will be facilitating us through how we embark on the inner journeys that are the absolute necessary steps towards achieving real justice. And this event is entitled the inner work, the inner work of bias and oppression. And I hope you all will be able to join us uh, as well this Wednesday from noon to 1 p.m. And lastly, thank you all so much for your financial support to keep these programs going. You can text SFA to 91999 to donate or click the links that my colleagues are posting into the chat. And on behalf of the entire Holocaust Center, thank you all so much for being with us today. And I hope you all please stay safe and just have a lovely and restful day. Thank you.